Uh, good morning still for a few more minutes. Um, welcome to the uh, Project Morphable webinar. We're going to kick off in about five minutes time, but I just wanted to open up the, um, open up the uh, broadcast so you knew we were here. So um, give it a few more minutes and then we'll kick off. Hello there and uh, welcome to this, the uh, second in our series of P2 webinars, Project Muffle. Um, the eagle-eyed amongst you would have noticed that this uh, isn't part of our uh, organised agenda um, of webinars uh, that we uh, publicised last week. But uh, we decided that this was a really important one to do, a very simple reason of all our clients at the moment, but literally all of them, are, have come to us and are asking for help either to decide or to actually do the active mothballing project. So it just felt like a really important uh, topic to have a conversation about. So over the next half hour, we'll be discussing really two things, actually. How do you make the mothballing decision and, and how do you mothball correctly? Um, as with uh, last week's webinar, um, it's quite a tight half hour. We'll, we'll try and take questions, but if not, um, don't worry, we will come back to you afterwards with, with answers to your questions. So do feel free to write them in. Um, we will be recording this uh, and we'll be sending um, uh, that recording to everyone who attended so you'll have access to this after the event and you can share that with your, your friends and colleagues. We're also going to look at a number of tools and templates that we use uh, in, in, in the real world um, during this uh, presentation. Um, we won't be sending those out with the recording just because we don't want to crash people's inboxes. But if you want copies of those, do feel free to drop us an email. Um, off the back of the uh, good email and we'll be very happy to share you those tools and templates. So uh, before we look in a bit more detail at how you make those decisions and how you do it right, let, let's, let's ask yourself the question of why, why is mothballing such a, such a hard concept? Well, for me, it's quite simple in terms of what it's trying to do. What mothballing is trying to do, it's about really putting something into a condition for storage or hibernation but ensuring it can be rapidly revitalized. That's quite a simple concept, but actually quite complicated in practice. I mean, in project terms, what you're really trying to do is firstly ensuring that your sunk costs are sensibly invested, so you're getting as much out of the already sunk costs as you possibly can. And secondly, that the project can be remobilized fast with maximum traction so that you can get back to business as usual as quickly as you possibly can when those green shoots start to appear. So there's really two very, very challenging decisions you need to make when it comes to the act of mothballing. Firstly, what you mothball as opposed to what you close, because of course there's extra resource involved in mothballing, resource that's um, very sorely needed, needed at this time. Uh, and secondly, what does mothballing actually mean in uh, the concept, the concept text of a large portfolio, and, and how do you uh, implement that? So we're going to dig into that into a lot more detail in, in a short while. Uh, before we do that, let me very quickly um, introduce uh, you to P2 for those who have not come across us before. Um, we're a, a global transformation consultancy uh, set up about seven years ago to uh, provide a real alternative uh, to the big four. Um, our goal is to deliver on what we've classed as our P2 promises, three promises, which is to improve, control and deliver on our clients transformation ambitions. Um, there are really 12 services that sit under those promises. Uh, today we're going to focus very heavily on the deliver promise and specifically how do you deliver your transformation portfolio during a period of crisis similar to the one we're facing at the moment. So just to introduce us very quickly, um, I'm Adam Skinner, I'm Director of Consulting for P2 Consulting. Um, there's my contact details, please feel free to, to, to link to me. I'm now going to hand over to my uh, co-host, Kate. Hi, everyone. and Thanks, Adam. As Adam says, I'm Kate Reed. I'm a managing consultant here at P2. 
Uh, my background's in portfolio management and transformation delivery across a wide range of public and private sector organisations. I'm going to be focusing on the initial crisis response and some of the potential mothballing techniques and approaches should we go down that route. So let's start with an image. This image shows the anticipated journey through this crisis period and on to recovery. And during this webinar, we'll really be focusing on the first half of this journey. Projects one to four represented on the left hand side are the, the business as usual situation. Most organisations were delivering against an agreed transformation agenda and suddenly the crisis hit. So there's going to be a period of uncertainty and we need to rapidly adjust to the changing conditions. We call this crisis response. And there are two main activities in this crisis response period. Firstly, we need to rapidly provide some kind of crisis reprioritization, which will identify which projects will be stopped, paused or mothballed, or perhaps accelerated or reshaped because they really need to deliver some value which will help us come out of the current crisis. Um, Adam's going to be focusing on those, but those last two are really important to remember um, in the current conditions. So we're really going to be focusing on uh, phases two and three during this webinar. Uh, the recovery reboot and reboot phases will follow and we'll have a webinar covering those. But it's important that we follow a, a, a proper procedure during the early stages so that we can optimise our reboot. So firstly, I want to describe what happens and some of the key elements during crisis prioritisation. Organisations may be used to prioritising their initiatives once or twice a year to deliver according to their existing business priorities. But these are really unprecedented times and we need to focus on what the new strategic direction of the organisation is to get us through this stage. So I'm going to be answering a couple of questions. So what does this prioritisation look like and what might some of the objectives be and some of the new constraints in this change portfolio? Crisis prioritisation is likely to be some kind of uh, workshop or committee, probably virtual, and it's going to be assembled to, to determine what stays and what goes in the change portfolio. It needs to be crisp and punchy, probably in a virtual room for a day or two with access to the material that uh, can help the decision makers right, make the right decision with all the right people involved. And what are some of the um, objectives of this? Um, that, that might happen. We're going to judge projects against some kind of um, crisis value score. So we need to take um, each project through that process. But the new objectives will depend very much on what type of business or organisation. You may be accelerating some projects that are delivered in capability, perhaps that um, enable your remote workforce to function effectively or to deliver uh, digital services. One of our big client, retail clients needs to adapt its focus to max, from maximising footfall to maximising access to its uh, online services. So we very much need to take the lead from the business here, but it's extremely likely that what we used to call critical a few weeks ago is no longer critical. So that has changed fundamentally. And we're also working across a backdrop where perhaps um, the change budget has changed, the focus, the workforce and relationships with suppliers have altered. I'm going to talk you through a, a, a quick approach to this. First of all, as I say, let's focus on the agreed um, and agree the new business priorities with the decision makers from the organisation. Let's review what our investment needs to be on this changed portfolio and what our new capabilities to deliver might be. It may be we need input from HR, finance, procurement or legal to help us with this. We then need to conduct um, a rapid revisit of each of the change initiatives and understand how they contribute to the new business priorities and what their criticality is at this point. Not forgetting that achievability might have changed. You know, we may have more opportunity to, to use the incumbent workforce, for example. The output of this is likely to be some kind of revised portfolio uh, with a focus on the mission critical initiatives and it's likely to be some project decisions so the decisions as to whether we're going to um, close projects um, actually uh, put them on pause or accelerate certain aspects of them whatever the decisions are we then need to communicate that with stakeholders and trigger the agreed project activity 
So a few key things to remember during this crisis prioritization are that we need really strong leadership here. We need crisp, clear decision-making. Not everyone has a part in the decision-making, but when it's um, provided, it needs to be based clearly on what the new priorities are with the organization, and they need to be communicated effectively. Planning and facilitating all of this is really important. And we're also doing it in a new virtual world. So there are plenty of tools and techniques that can help us do this effectively. Um, we're, that's actually going to be a subject of uh, another webinar in the next few weeks. Um, but suddenly doing this wholesale is important to consider how you can do that effectively. And it needs to be carefully led. Finally, let's remember this is a change management activity. And like any change management activity, we need to understand the potential resistance to change and how important leadership and communication is key in doing this and making sure everyone knows what's going on and what the outputs are. So bearing that in mind throughout. I'm just going to dive down a little to um, the decisions around uh, what you do with the projects. So Adam's going to focus a little more on the accelerate and reshape, where you can really extract some value on something mission critical and use your uh, workforce to redeploy and help deliver some critical elements. But I just want to stop and think about the stop and mothball dynamic at the moment. So um, I've been in plenty of portfolios where there have been projects where um, uh, perhaps they've delivered their main value or have been struggling to get traction or have been um, you've put a lot of effort to making them happen perhaps they're niche or non-critical um, now's a really good opportunity to actually stop those so you're not going through the whole exercise of putting them on hold you're just going through the standard project closure exercise mothballing is slightly different because you know that once your initial crisis period is over you're going to restart these projects they do contribute highly to the organization's long-term strategy. They might have been yesterday's must-dos, but right now we can afford to pause those for a moment and put them on ice until we're ready to reboot. So however we organize this, we're likely to um, need to describe very clearly what those um, parameters are and what the key drivers are. And we're likely to get out a, a couple of portfolio kind of outputs. We've actually revisited our existing prioritization model, and we've got something we can share with you, which really helps us to focus the mind on the more mission critical elements and provides weighting that adjusts that. So um, again, reach out to us if that would be helpful. And it uh, provides um, the normal kind of bubble charts and other things that might be useful. One thing to remember as well, um, before I move on, I just want to um, and make a nod to the Agile environment. So um, Agile environments um, are continually reshaping the project priorities in business as usual, but the um, value streams have fundamentally changed and in the constrained environment, they may not be able to um, uh, release as, as many releases as planned and they might be doing so with uh, less velocity. So again, many of our clients are working in agile environments. Um, this exercise still is important, but it, there are different ways to think about some of the projects and how they operate. So now I'm going to come on to what you might do should you be um, dealing with a number of different projects that have been uh, told to mothball, or indeed if you're at the project manager being asked to uh, mothball your project. Essentially, we want to ask uh, the following questions. How do we pause a number of projects systematically and efficiently? And how do we make sure that they can revitalize quickly? And if there's anything that we can salvage from them? So how do we quickly revitalize? Um, it's important to start with the end in mind. Imagine you're opening up all this project material where some of the key resources may no longer be available. The contracting agreement has been paused and the backdrop to the project has moved on. All project managers that are putting their projects to sleep should imagine that they're also picking up perhaps not the same project, but a different one in the future. And one of the key things that we think we should draw out of this exercise is really a remobilization guide. So this is uh, the nuts and bolts of um, if you uh, lift up the hood or the bonnet of the, um, uh, the project, what is the, the key things that you need to know about? It might include the first month's plan, for example, of remobilizing. And what can we quickly salvage? We've already talked at a portfolio level of some of the key things that we might want to accelerate or reshape. 
but it's only when you really dive down into the projects that you might realize that there's something you've missed. So you need a way of having an exercise of escalating that and making sure it gets considered and can be included in what your um, hibernation period will look like. Um, I heard recently of a, uh, an area where at first glance, a finance project wasn't um, deemed mission critical, but there was something in it that was very significant. So that, the, that was pointed out at, from the project. So I'm gonna take you through a brief process of what this would look like. First of all, we need to develop a more falling checklist. I'm gonna give you a quick demo of one that was um, developed uh, by a colleague of mine, Adrian Mangan. Um, and this is something that we've adapted and we have a generic version of this that again, we're able to share. But essentially, this is a checklist of all the activity that needs to be completed, categorized in different ways um, by the projects. And in, if you want all the projects to be mothballed in a common way, it's important to de develop one of these quickly. And I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of this um, at next. We also need to remember, again, this is a change management exercise. We need to give guidance to the project managers on how we expect them to complete this because um, it needs to be done in, a, um, a, in the same way. And you need to give plenty of opportunity for the project teams to ask questions and understand it properly. Now, you might set some guidelines of how long it's going to take for them to, do, um, to, uh, uh, to mothball the project, um, uh, but then you need to hand that on to uh, the projects and you ask them to conduct the mothball activity and complete the checklist. Like any checklist, it's only as good as the activity that's being completed. So this becomes really the tracker document and it enables the project manager to work with their teams to divide and conquer. They may not be doing delivery anymore, but they need to rapidly um, go through and make sure everything is in the right place. And somehow you need to have some central function that um, deals with exceptions and deals with issues collects any key remaining risks, dependencies, or opportunities as a result of this. And that's likely to need some kind of um, uh, document which summarizes that. Uh, and I'll show you uh, an example of that as well. So what are the, some of the key considerations during this process? First of all, you've got to bear in mind that a lot of people are very invested in their change initiatives from project sponsors to project teams to suppliers. So handling this sensitively and making sure you've got clear leadership through and keeping morale and motivation up during this time is really important. Um, we also need to make sure that this isn't just about storing documents. 10 years ago, we would have been talking about a checklist, which was just documents, but really we're thinking about where is the capability and knowledge in the organization and how we're going to keep that live during the hibernation period. And any way we can think of in the mobilization guide or the mothballing checklist to do this will be extremely useful. So I've talked um, importantly about the remobilization guide. So this is really the key for it. Yes, we're going to have um, all the projects stored areas, um, uh, file structure and, and stored areas, but we're also going to have this remobilization guide, which will consist of the first month's plan uh, for uh, an incumbent project manager. And finally, quick wins. So um, we need to have a mechanism by which those are identified and they get fed up to the people that are working with you, uh, remaining change portfolio to make sure they don't get forgotten. So that gives you a flavor for the activity in that period. I'm going to uh, move across now and just show you a little bit of a demonstration of what this might look like. So this um, is uh, an example mothballing checklist, and it consists of uh, two main uh, tabs or attributes. So the first one is really the checklist itself. So you can see that we've organized this according to categories. Um, you might find in your organization that delivery activity breaks down into various stages. So there may be other ways that, um, that work for the organization. Uh, there may be subcategories within that. And really, column C is what you have to do um, in terms of um, uh, putting this project on pause. The status will enable the project manager to uh, rapidly um, track and uh, distribute activity to members of the team and report their progress. Uh, so in this case, green is complete, amber's 
something is in progress, but we we think we can complete it. Pink is again, we think we can complete it, but we haven't started yet. And red is where there might be an issue that needs to be escalated centrally, and that um, could be um, something that the uh, central function needs to take forward. This also shows some opportunities to record any gaps, um, when it was complete, and who's, who it's approved by. And again, the communications in the organisation needs to explain how that all works. It could be the project board that approves, it could be some kind of central function. So this tracker will be really key, and uh, again, it's something we can uh, let you have a version of, so you can um, uh, compare it to your organisation and create something really quickly. Uh, the reporting status will enable you to have a look at where you are in the uh, current climate and whether um, you can, uh, where, the, where there might be issues. So, for example, this project, they're going to have need a lot of help to get over the line and to pause it um, uh, by the uh, required date. So that really is what I want to uh, say about the mothballing checklist and the mothballing process. I'm going to um, return now to um, the next slide and ask Adam to continue to talk through the reshaping and acceleration process. That's great. Thanks, Kate. So um, understanding most of the focus in your organisation probably to this point has been on uh, what, to, what to kill, essentially, what projects to shut down uh, in an attempt to uh, protect resource uh, and protect cost, which is a resistance of things there, obviously. Um, but I'd like to propose that actually the flip side is equally, if not more important, because um, another really important thing to think about is where should you be directing your resource to survive and, and to thrive during this crisis? So it's really important to spend a little bit of time thinking about which of your remaining projects, either the ones that haven't been multiple and closed, should you be accelerating and which you should be reshaping. Uh, really the name of the game here is to, to find and prioritise the critical benefits in your remaining projects because I absolutely uh, uh, promise you that what was a critical benefit you know three four five months ago is not a critical benefit at the moment. Um, the stuff that you'll be trying to do at the moment will be around cost reduction, it will be around um, increasing your ability to sell digitally, it will be around your increasing your ability to re uh, remote work. So we'd like to strongly recommend you, you, you do three things, three. and all of these things will be occurring not necessarily at the project level, because don't forget you've already essentially done that project uh, assessment. This is going to be occurring at the project level, level the sort of the, the benefit level. So we're suggesting you want to do three things. Firstly, you'll want to reevaluate. You, you'll want to have a look at those individual deliverables and reassess them against the new organisational strategies to try and identify the ones that are absolutely mission critical. By mission critical, I essentially mean the ones that you need to land in the next month or so to survive what's going to be the hibernation period. Once you've identified those, we do what we call re-architect, and that's really about building uh, probably a single program, a single must, uh, must mission critical, must deliver program of those key benefits and key projects. Um, now this is what we call the accelerate projects and you'll remember from our four things. So these are the accelerate projects, the projects that need to land in the next month or so to allow you to get through the hibernate period. What that's going to do though is leave a whole load of um, other project deliverables that are um, still really important to your organisation but not quite in the top rank that we've got the in the accelerate projects. We call these the reshape and actually what you're looking to do then is group those into a program of Audio, uh, that's designed to deliver those in the most low risk and low cost fashion. So, so revalue, it's re-architect and reshape. And of course, it's it's much more easily said than than done. I would really strongly suggest you try and use a structural methodology to try and identify what we're going to do and try and find value. Um, if you have a look on the right hand side, we've got two uh, two sort of methodologies you can use. The, the top right is a, a really simplistic one, and it's really just taking the um, if you like the iron triangle of project management, uh, cost, scope, and time, which allows you to try and work out around those three metrics. What am I going to flex to reshape that project? Am I going to increase, decrease cost? Am I going to increase time, decrease time, increase scope, decrease scope? Um, quality, we'd say, stays stable forever. You always want to maintain quality. If, if something's worth doing, it's, it's worth doing well. Uh, bottom right is um, our Peter's bespoke adaptive delivery. 
framework, and that's a framework that we use to uh, to break down the program architecture uh, into sort of iterative chunks of value, which you deliver regularly and often to ensure that you're moving in the right direction and you're learning as you as you deliver. Um, there's a lot more under that framework than those simple words. We've got a webinar in, on it in a couple of weeks if you're interested in learning more about that particular framework. But my, my, my point is not to use one of these specifically, more to say that actually finding value quickly is a hard thing to do and value will have changed in the crisis world. So it's sensible to try and use something to help you track down the value in your remaining portfolio and structure delivery of that correctly so you can make the most of the resources that you've got. So as much as your organisation will be focusing on what to close and not as I say, we'd really strongly recommend that you focus on what to accelerate and what to uh, reshape. So we've talked a bit about the activities that occur during the crisis response phase. Um, that's, of course, quite a quick phase that happens over a short period of time. Um, what we call the hibernation phase, which is essentially when you're running um, business as usual at a lower, at a lower level of resources, can run for a lot longer time, of course. Now, we'd argue that beyond the standard functions of your central BPM, there's really two important things you're trying to do there. And one's looking at the activities you should be doing to prepare for recovery when you hit that recovery point. Number two is what we call housekeeping improvements. So if we have a look at the um, additional functions to prepare for recovery. Now, this is all stuff that I expect to occur in the central function, whether that's a portfolio officer or PPM capability. The point being, this all relates to multiple projects, but there's no longer really a uh, project team. And that's very, really important thing you should be trying to do here. First, we call it capability tracking. And Kate alluded to how actually what knowledge means in the modern age is not so much what's in a document, what's in a plan, Actually, what's the capability and the, um, the, the organizational knowledge, the people that stored it? It's incredibly important that someone in the central function is tracking where that knowledge exists, which projects those individuals have gone to, where it may have gone outside of the company, how you're going to get it back in. Um, the one thing that will stop you kicking off your projects fast when it comes time to revitalize is a lack of ability to get that knowledge back. So incredibly important to keep track of that. Second one is what we call owning the multiple portfolio. And again, this is about making sure someone in the central function is keeping, um, if, if you like, an eye on the metrics around those multiple projects so that when it comes to have strategic discussions around the portfolio at the end of the year or next year, you're not forgetting that there was this chunk of stuff that's supposed to be, ha supposed to be happening. So someone in the centre should be owning the costs and the benefits and the like of, of what will be the multiple portfolio when it's re-energised. Re 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 and finally, portfolio reboot planning. We talked a bit about um, when you shut down your multiple your projects, creating a reboot plan. This is about pulling those plans together and owning them, making sure they are socialized and shared um, so that people know what's going to happen. And we'll talk a lot more about the rebooting at the next webinar, but in a, in a nutshell, it needs to be treated as a project in its own right so that projects can be stood up fast and effectively to give you an advantage when uh, those green shoots are seen. So those first three functions are all about ensuring rapid recovery time is right. The second three functions are really about the housekeeping, getting your central function um, and getting your PPM capability ready and optimized for the recovery phase. Again, three things here. Firstly, and something I really like to do a, a lot whenever I'm doing a PPM review is what we call customer satisfaction. That's a slightly wishy-washy term for something really important, and that's taking the time to ask your stakeholders, your program directors, your C-suite, your business owners, what they think is good and bad about the change uh, capability at the moment. Um, it's a really helpful thing to try and do and really helps you understand what's good and what's bad and what you need to do more of. We'd recommend spending a bit of time to strengthen the reporting structure. So that's actually looking at where the information comes from, um, testing new ideas, building and coaching around that. And finally, you might want to look at strengthening your delivery framework. And that's either what we might call refactoring, so looking at how you do it at the moment and simplifying it, or actually maybe bringing in something new, maybe you've been looking to apply agile. Um, this is a great time to look at that, to co-create a delivery framework, to coach and to improve so that when it comes time to uh, recover, you're hitting the ground running in the best shape you possibly can. So we're going to finish uh, very shortly. We're going to have a quick look at the key principles. Um, and for me, those key principles are threefold. I think 
Number one is the central coordination. That central coordination is key. It, it's a critical function to do that. Um, crisis response must be coordinated. That has to be the top priority. Uh, multiple projects require ownership that needs to sit in the centre. And as I say, organisational knowledge requires tracking. What's valuable for the organisation has changed. We've talked about this a lot, but you'd be amazed how often it gets missed. Um, so important to, to, to look again at what value needs now, and this needs to be shared organisation wide. And thirdly, communication is absolutely mission critical. We've said a few times that change management, uh, this is a change management challenge. Communication during crisis is a different challenge as well. And there's some great um, online um, online tools around how you should communicate in a crisis as opposed to communicating in BAU times. Uh, I definitely recommend you try and hunt those down. And finally, and this is quite, quite a psychological point, but there's a huge amount of fear and uncertainty out there at the moment um, for obvious reasons. The one best way of combating fear and uncertainty is through communication, is sharing information. That so often has to be done centrally. Um, incredibly important. Communication combats fear and uncertainty. So we are just about out of time now. Um, Thank you to everyone who's once again uh, dialed in to, to listen to us. Um, as mentioned, uh, we'll be sharing the recording of this uh, in the next uh, few days. Um, do please come back to us if you'd like a template. We've got uh, a couple more webinars coming up over the next few weeks. Uh, next week we'll be talking about uh, the Lean Agile part of PMO and the world of scaled agile, which should be an interesting one. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. So I hope you have a lovely and very safe Easter break. Thanks very much.